by God, common people in the hands of an uncommon God. Today I am excited because I'm going to talk to you about, honestly, my personal biblical hero and how he was used by God. You could easily do probably five to six weeks or more to really encompass everything that has to do with this guy and his story, but unfortunately we have to do a quicker overview uh, this morning, and basically we want to show how his story, but how our story too, it, it fits into the bigger story that God has and then connects with ours. See, when you look at being used by God, there's the big picture and there's the little picture. There's the upper story and there's the lower story. See, the big picture, that's that overall plan of God. That's the overall picture that God is painting. His vision is that he sees where it all began, he knows where it's going, and he knows how it all ends. To a point, we know how some of it ends, right? It tells us, and we like the ending. But God's big vision for creation was that he wanted to extend community to us, and he wanted to be with us. But then in that lower story, we made a choice, and the choice was to do our own thing to go our own way, and it resulted in sin and separation from God. And so the lower story that, that fits into the upper stories is the rest of the Bible, the story that God's telling, the extent to which he would go in order to restore the story that he desires and to go and get us back, eventually leading to Revelation where there's a new heaven, a new earth. We get to enter into that Eden of a world once again if you've trusted in Jesus and you'll be with him forever. And as we relate this and look at today's youth story, due to all of that, everything we go through, the constant travel through the adventure that is life, that is our lower story participating in that upper story, I want you to consider this this morning, that even when God feels far away, he's always by your side. Even when he feels far away, he's always by your side. Quick timeline here to get you there. Abraham and Sarah had Isaac. Isaac and Rebekah had Jacob. And then Jacob had 12 sons. And the focal point of today's story is one of those sons, Joseph. And, and Joseph's story, being one of 12 boys, he actually had this positional place that we see in Scripture he was daddy's favorite. Anybody relate to that? Anybody out there, daddy's favorite? If your sibling's in here with you, don't raise your hand. <laughs> we pick up the story with Joseph at about 17 years old. Now, because he was daddy's favorite, he got a special gift, right? The coat of many colors. He got this beautiful coat that his father Jacob gave him. And Joseph also had this gift from God. He would have dreams, but he had this ability to interpret those dreams and this coat along with the dreams they were seen and they were heard by his brothers and i don't know about you but this is the kind of stuff that maybe just maybe at times you want to keep to yourself instead of sharing with everybody because i don't think his brothers took too kindly to it so in genesis 37 it says this now israel loved joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And of course, that dream was multiplied with the fact that these wheat were bowing down to another one. And, and they're all looking at this like, what, you, you, not only does dad pick you as a favorite, you think you're better than us. They'd had enough at this point, and Joseph is told by his father, hey, go out, visit your brothers, check in on them. They're out watching the sheep. He goes out, and they see him coming from a ways off, and they begin to plot something. Many of them say, let's kill him. We've got to get rid of him. He's a pest. But the oldest brother, Reuben, he kind of stops and tracks. He says, no, 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 no. We need to teach him a lesson, but let's just throw him in this cistern. Let's just throw him in this pit. And Reuben's thought was, we'll throw him in the pit, and then we'll go home, and later tonight, when they don't know it, I'll go back out, I'll get him, I'll rescue him, I'll bring him home. 
but the plan backfired, didn't it? We clearly see the plan backfired. Continuing in chapter 37. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe of many colors, and they took and threw him into a pit. Then they sat down to eat. Wow. No guilty conscience, apparently. Looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming on their way to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And his brothers listened to him. They drew Joseph up and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Hmm. How's your relationship with your siblings? <laughs> Most of us know the rest of the part of the story. I mean, to cover it up, they take the colorful coat and they kill an animal in the wild. They put blood on it and they took it to present it to Jacob because they, they knew that then he would think that Joe was attacked and killed by a wild animal and the plan worked and Jacob thought he just lost his son. Now, meanwhile, in Egypt, Joseph is sold to a na man named Potiphar. Potiphar is the captain of the guard for Pharaoh. And in a very short period of time, Joseph goes from daddy's favorite to a slave in the foreign land of Egypt at the age of 17. I don't know about you, but that's a tough couple of days. I mean, imagine the questions that may have been racing through his mind. I know what I would have been thinking. Where in the world is God in the midst of all of this? This is such a disappointment, this difficulty. Why is this happening? This might be a good time to remind you of this and make sure that it stays in your mind. Keep this in mind. Even when God feels far away, he's always by your side. God didn't leave Joseph in this. When all of this was taking place, look what it says. We're to chapter 39. It starts, verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. So despite all of this, we know he didn't leave him. And what happened? He became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he'd had. Yeah, the Lord was definitely with Joseph. Despite this disappointment, despite this difficulty, but despite being ripped from his family and sold as a slave in Egypt, he is succeeding at high levels. He is being honored at high levels. Now, some of you might be thinking, there may be those that think, you know what, if God was really with Joseph, he wouldn't let any of this happen in the first place. But see, that's exactly the perspective that we would have if we're looking at the small picture and just the lower story. That makes perfect sense if you're looking at it that way. But it fits into the upper story. We've got to remember, God sees the big picture. He has the upper story in mind, even when we're going through our lower story. And he alone is able to use those life events to accomplish his upper story. We know God did not leave Joseph. He worked through him. He worked through the circumstances that he was going through, and he accomplished more because of it. All things considered at this point, I'd say Joseph is doing pretty good. God blessed everything in Potiphar's household because Joseph was there and serving. Finally, it seems like he's catching a break, right? He's finally catching a break. <laughs> then she happened. Dang it, woman. Joseph was, as scripture says, a very well-built and handsome young man. And apparently Potter's wife thought so too. So she starts to try to seduce him. She's putting on music every time he's around and lighting up the candles. She's pressing play on Huey Lewis and the Power of Love, playing a little Kenny Loggins' Danger Zone, like you know what you're getting into. And this is what it says in 39 as we continue. After a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, my master has put everything that he has in my charge. Nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Oh, notice this. Joseph had a great understanding here. He wasn't just thinking about the evil that would happen because of his master. He's saying, why would I do this and sin against God? Recognizing that Joseph knew that God had his back and had been doing everything to bless his life at this point. 
And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her, or to be with her. Now, he wasn't responding the way she wanted. That's abundantly clear. But apparently, it just didn't matter. She wasn't taking the hint. No matter how hard she tried, though, he refused her. Day after day, this continued. So she decides it's time to turn up the heat. It's time for a little Barry White and boys to men, baby. We got to do something about this. Did it work? Verses 11 and 12. But one day when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. Joseph is emulating one of the biggest points to sin in Scripture. When it comes to sin in our lives and it comes to temptation, we know that God will always provide a way out. But when it comes to sexual temptation, you know what Scripture says? Run. It says flee. Run away from it. And Joseph is literally and physically doing exactly that. And what we see happening in Joseph's life right now, again, is more disappointment. All these big dreams. Now a slave, had his loving family. Now he's got nobody. Yet in the midst of all this disappointment, he continues to trust and honor God in the decisions that he's making. For many of us, the tendency in this situation, when we allow disappointment or discomfort to come in, we allow that to justify our disobedience. We think God's not holding up his end of the deal. You don't like what he's doing or what he's saying to you. He's let you down. So you know what? I'm just going to do what I want. But Joseph didn't do that. He emulated the opposite. He chose obedience. He's certainly due for a break, right? I mean, seriously. Despite everything, he's being obedient to God through the most difficult circumstances he's faced at such a young age. He's got to catch a break. No. No break yet. Verses 13 to 15. And as soon as she saw that he left his garment and fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household. See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came into me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice, he left his garment and fled. When she doesn't get her way, she accuses him falsely. Awesome. Awesome. This is what Joseph is getting for serving God and being obedient. He's a slave. Now he's going to be a prisoner. Surely God's left him, right? No. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. So he becomes a slave, he's shown favor in the house, and things are blessed. Now he's gone into prison, but what? God's still with him. He's seeing favor from the keeper of the prison, and blessings are going to come out of that. God continued to be with Joe. Joe continued to trust God, and God continued to use the difficulties of Joe's lower story to work the greater upper story. As we continue, we discover that God gave Joseph the ability to interpret dreams, we knew that to a point already, but now we see it in action. In his time in jail, there are two officials that used to work for Pharaoh that had been put in prison, and they both had dreams, and Joseph interpreted both of those dreams, and he did it accurately. What he interpreted came true for both of them. And two years later, Pharaoh has a dream, and his advisors, they can't interpret it. And one of those officials who'd been in prison with Joseph had been restored to his position, and he recalled, oh yeah, I know a guy. And so he tells Pharaoh about him. And Pharaoh sends for him and says, I need him to come. I need him to interpret the dream. And in Genesis 41, that's exactly what Joseph does for him. He says, there will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them, there will arise seven years of famine. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man. Set him over the land of Egypt. Take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine. Joe tells him the meaning. He interprets the dream. 
Pharaoh's response? Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. Joseph basically just got put almost on the exact same level as Pharaoh. God has never left him. Even when you feel that way, he's always by your side. Now, at this point now, we're getting to the point, Joseph's grown up. He's grown older. He's 30 years old at this point. I mean, it only took 13 years from when he was first sold in slavery by his brothers to get to this point. But we actually have to jump forward another nine years. He's now 39 years old. He's successfully done what Pharaoh asked based on the interpretation of dreams. He's stored up the food during the seven years of prosperity to help feed the people of Egypt. And the drought is now two years old. But there's a fact here. They actually stored up enough food to help the surrounding nations and the surrounding people who would come to them and get this because they were within that famine. Now Joe's dad, Jacob, you remember him, right? He'd heard about this abundance of food in Egypt. And so he sends his sons, minus one, the youngest, that had come after Joseph had been gone, Benjamin. He sends the rest of them to go get food. And upon arrival, do they recognize Joseph? No. They don't recognize their brother. It had been 22 years since they last saw him. But Joseph recognized them. Imagine the emotions that are going through him. I wonder what our reaction would have been. I, I don't know about you, but the emotions in me would have been anger and hatred and frustration and a desire for revenge. Joseph didn't see it that way. Instead, he decides, you know, I still get to have a little fun. So he pretends not to know them, and then he accuses them of being spies. And in this conversation, he discovers he has a younger brother he's never met. He says, but Joseph said to them, it is as I said to you, you are spies. By this you shall be tested. You shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. On the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you're honest, men, let one of your brothers remain confined where you are in custody. Let the rest go and carry grain for your famine of your households and bring your youngest brother to me. So your words will be verified and you shall not die. And they did so. But they did it in fear, man. His brothers were fearing that if they bring back Benjamin, it'll be the death of their father. He already broke in the midst of losing Joseph. And now, beloved Benjamin, they want They've been told they got to take him from their father. So nine of them returned with the food, and when it ran out, they told Jacob, we got to return, we got to go get more. Oh, and by the way, we got to take Benjamin with us this time. And Jacob didn't like that at all. And Judah, Judah vowed that he would protect him. Here's the interesting thing. Judah's the one that vows to protect him. I wonder if there was a little bit of a guilty conscience on Judah since he was the one that had the idea to sell Joseph to the Ishmaelites. He'd already cost his father one son. He wasn't about ready to cost him another one. And let me tell you, he was not going to be excited that he made that vow. Because they go back with Benjamin to get more food, and Joe sets a trap. He puts gold and silver cups in Benjamin's sack of grain and accuses him of stealing. And now the brothers are absolutely distraught, and they're pleading for Benjamin for the sake of their father Jacob. And through this process, eventually Joseph just can't take it anymore, and he makes himself known to his brothers. He says, so Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. In that moment, Joseph has a complete clarity of the upper story, of the bigger picture of God. 
He had that light bulb moment that there had been a greater plan all along. The lower story that he had to endure meant that he would be a slave, he would be a prisoner, but that he would be exalted to the leader of a nation, making the upper story that God had been using him to preserve his people and the nation that he had promised would exist. I mean, after all, you can't have a nation of people if they all starve to death. You've got to love the moments in life when the big picture truth is revealed. I have a name for them. I call them two-by-four moments. What happens is, is out of nowhere, you feel God hit you in the back of the head with a two-by-four and knock you over. And you see that he was there all along. A lot of times you just lose sight of it for a little bit. For most of us, that usually only happens in hindsight. But Joe, Joe had trusted God through it all. He took every single step with a grain of salt, allowing him to lean into the difficulties, trusting that God was going to be faithful and accomplish the bigger picture that was still unfolding. Man, if we could have that type of faith. We should have that type of faith. That's how big our God is. That's how strong our Creator is. That's how awesome Yahweh is. To breathe Him in day and night and to know that pithy little us <laughs> he wants us he wants us to be used by him in the bigger picture in the greater story that he has we let the difficulty of our lower story get in the way of seeing that don't we guilty joseph actually has to revisit this truth later on when his father dies because his father dies after they all come to Egypt, and now his brothers are fearing that, well, now that dad's dead, now he's going to take out his anger on us. But see, Joseph had been able to genuinely forgive because he had been able to capture that bigger picture, because of his two-by-four moment where the clarity was there. In Genesis 50, 19 and 20, it says, But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you men evil against me. <clears throat> but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Now, Joseph could have chosen revenge against his brothers, but through the life experience, he gained a humility and a generosity that he couldn't have gained any other way. Suffering has a purifying effect on our character and on our motives. It can actually knock out the arrogance and the selfishness, and it can allow humility and generosity to seep in in their place if we approach it from a heart of faith. We gain humility through our life experiences. The difficulties, honestly, at times are meant to knock us down a peg and open our eyes to the truth. These days, that's not a normal thing in society. I mean, Star athletes and performers, yeah, they got a lot of tremendous talent and skills, but no real humility. They don't really know how to be humble, they just know how to be talented. And you kind of hope that, you know, maybe 20 years down the line, that as they go through the life experiences, that maybe they'll become more humble and more generous. A lot of times, it's why we pray for brokenness when we see arrogance in someone's life. We'll pray, God, you need to break them. It's why we encourage people to embrace the suffering and the pain when it occurs, because God's refining you in a way. Instead of just asking God to take it away or give us the easy path so that we don't have to worry about feelings, God doesn't waste our time, guys. He doesn't waste our heartache, and he doesn't waste our pain. He uses it, and he uses our lower story for the glory of God's upper story. James is a book that's so hard to swallow, but it gives reference to this point so well. Count it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And when perseverance has had its full effect, you will be made perfect, lacking in nothing. Even when 
God feels far away. Even when he doesn't feel close, even when you don't think he's there, he's always by your side. Sometimes we have to take the opportunity to look at the picture in the lower story and ask God to show us how it fits into the upper story. Sometimes we got to ask for the two by four. No matter if he feels far away, he's always by your side. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you promise that you never leave us or forsake us. Thank you that no matter how it ends, you're right beside us. Thank you, Father, for the story and the example of Joseph. A man who trusted no matter what came his way, knowing that your upper story was working, and all he had to do was remain faithful, and it would play out exactly as it was supposed to. Your plan is perfect. Father, help us to stop, whether in difficulty or not, coming and saying, hey, God, here's my plan, now do it. But instead, come humbly before you, Father, and say, show me your plan, Lord, and how I get to be a part of it. Use me for your glory. Then we will be able to see the bigger picture then you will reveal your truth. Cover us as we go, Father, and help us rely on you this week above all. We pray this in your powerful name, Jesus. Amen.